one slide. See, so I'm going to put this one up here at the beginning, and then it'll just stay there. Yes? No? No? There it is. All right. See, that's easy. Now I can get rid of this. This is the map I had up last week, and I just want to, or two weeks ago, I just want to pick up, briefly remind you where we are in the book of Ezekiel, just summarize a, a little bit of the background. Now, you'll recall that the, with the Babylonians' defeat of the Egyptians, you see that city up there? I didn't bring my little nifty pointer, but Carchemish in 605 B.C., with that defeat, the Babylonian defeat of the Egyptians, then their rule of Palestine was secure. And that is really the, you know, when the, the Neo-Babylonian Empire was firmly established. So we have the Babylonians who are in control of Palestine, and then there were a series of deportations. You have in 605 B.C., Daniel and some others are taken to Babylon. And then in 598, 597, you have another massive deportation. And that's when Jehoiakim, King Jehoiakim, the royal family, Ezekiel, and many other people are taken to, to Babylonia, 590, 598 or 597. I, I keep doing it that way because there's some debate about exactly which year it was. And then you have another series of deportations in 587 and 586 when Zedekiah rebelled. And you have uh, the Babylonians then come and they destroy Jerusalem, including the temple, and they cart off even more people into Babylonian captivity. Now, Ezekiel was the son of a priest named Buzi, and Ezekiel was born in 623 B.C., probably. And so he's about 25 years old when he's taken into captivity by the Babylonians in 598, 597. Now, you can imagine, see, because the, the priesthood, he's trained all his life to be a priest, and, and that really doesn't kick in formally and officially until he's 30 years old. So here he is coming close to realizing the goal of his life, and he gets taken into Babylonian captivity. And you can see how crushing that would be. He's away from the temple, can't worship properly. None of the Jewish exiles can. And so here he is in this state of discouragement, but he's there, and, and after he's been in captivity for about, uh, he's taken when he's 25, he's settled in this Jewish colony. I don't think that it, it's reflected correctly here, but they have Tel Aviv, and sometimes you see it as Tel Aviv with bees. That's just a, a way of transliteration. But he's settled near, near the Kabar Canal, near the city of Nippur. And this was a Jewish colony, and they had a, different colonies around, so they take the Jews there, and, and Ezekiel is, is there. And the date of his prophecies, he has a number of them that are dated, and they range from 593 B.C. to 571 B.C. Now, there's some that are undated, but the dated ones, you see them covering that range. So 593, just to keep the picture in your mind, he's been exiled. He was exiled about five years before that. Then he has visions, and he has, he has prophecies from 593, and then this is six or seven years before the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And then he prophesies for 15 or 16 years after the destruction of the temple. Okay, just so you keep that, that setting in mind. The book is arranged thematically around four major sections. And then within those sections, it's almost strictly chronological. You can play with how you divide the sections up. A lot of people put three sections and combine the last two, but I've got four sections. And the sections are before the fall of Jerusalem. That's chapters 1 through 24. These all deal before the fall of Jerusalem. So before 587, 586, that's when this period of time, the first 24 chapters, chapters 25 through 32, these are oracles against the foreign nations. And then chapters 33 through 39, hope and danger in the future. Chapters 40 to 48 is the vision of the new temple and land. So four sections, at least the way I'm looking at it, uh, thematic sections, Within those sections, the material is arranged uh, almost strictly chronologically. Now, he, in the fifth year of his exile, it's 593 B.C., okay? So he's, he's away in front of six or seven years before Jerusalem and the temple is destroyed. Ezekiel is called to serve as God's prophet. Just coincidentally, this is right about the time that he would be formally introduced into the priesthood. So he now, about 30 years old, is called to serve as God's prophet. And in chapter 1, verses 4 through 21, he's given this awesome vision of cherubim that are appearing in the storm, in that storm cloud as bearers of the divine chariot, and that's what we talked about two weeks ago, and you really need to read it. I mean, it is a mind-blowing vision that he's given. 
And he's sitting here and he's, he's sitting here and sees this thing. And you can imagine seeing something, you know, we are so, I guess, visually saturated in our culture. You know, we've got the ability to do all of these things, Star Wars and all these special effects and all this kind of stuff that people do, animation and these things, that it doesn't hit us with the same power that this vision would have hit Ezekiel with. Can you imagine, you, know, you haven't seen these kinds of things done by artists and all this stuff. Now, here, here he is, and force you see a storm cloud. I mean, th there's a few things as powerful. And so here comes this storm cloud with these tremendous flashes in it and everything, and then he sees these cherubim in there, and you know something is going on. So he's being called, and these creatures in the wheels of the chariot, I, I tried to point out last week that they're oriented in all directions, both the creatures and the wheels. You remember they had the intersecting wheels? And you had the creatures that, have, that look in all directions. And so you have this idea that this, this symbol, symbolizing that the chariot can go anywhere at any time. Okay, there is no restriction on it at all. And God travels the whole world that is in, is in control of all of it. He is in control of all of it. And God's being on the move is a cause of encouragement for people who truly worship him. So I think this is what you see at least something I get out of, of verses 4 through 21. I want to pick back up in verse 22. I said, I'm not going to be able to read through the whole book, but I'm going to read through as, you know, I, some of it I just have to read because if I just say stuff about it and you haven't seen the image, it's just no good. But uh, some of the things I'll be able to just talk about in big chunks like that without reading through the whole thing. Otherwise, we'd never get through it. But I'm going to begin in, in, in verse 22. Let me go back and pick up 19 just to remind you a little bit about this image, and I'm going to start it in earnest in verse 22. I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 19, it says, when, when, I'm reading out of the NIV, it says, when the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like an expanse, sparkling like ice and awesome. Under the expanse, their wings were stretched out one toward the other, and each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the expanse over their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire. And high above on the throne was a figure that looked like that of a, like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire, and that from there down he looked like fire, and brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Well, you can imagine... I mean, what Ezekiel sees here, these, these cherubim, they're pictured as supporting this gem-like firmament, and a firmament is something that's spread out, you know, broad and spread out. So they're pictured as supporting this firmament that functions as a platform for God's throne. So here we have his chariot, then we have these cherubim who are pictured as supporting this firmament that is a platform of the throne of the Almighty. So as they're moving him around, so to speak, Okay, so here he is, and he gets this image of God, and it's the likeness on the throne. He cannot see God directly. He is given a revelation of the likeness, a representation of God. And he says the likeness of God here, the likeness on the throne was that of God, and he could not really be seen except in his general shape. Okay, he, has this, 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 he sees this general shape, and the most visible feature was his glorious shining brightness. Okay, so here is this, this man who's in exile, who's worshipped God all his life, and he's given this vision and he sees this incredible 
image, this representation of God, this glorious shining brightness and this entire vision proclaims through this imagery the glory, the holiness, and the sovereignty of God. See, I've always, you know, I don't know how many times I've told you about that cartoon in the, in the uh, New Yorker that always bugged me, where that guy was getting ready to prepare to meet thy God, and he's straightening his tie and all that stuff. See, there is just so much in our society that misses the glory and the majesty of God and who he is, that we talk about him all the time, you know, like in profane terms and this kind of, this is God. See, this is the picture that God is giving mankind and giving Ezekiel. He's just majestic, the other, glowing, this incredible brightness. Now, Ezekiel naturally falls on his face. I mean, that was the standard practice when appearing before an earthly monarch. We probably wouldn't do that because, you know, we come from a, a culture that's rebellious and all this kind of stuff, and the idea of doing that before a human being, we'd say, you know, drop dead, chump. You know, to before a king, I mean, that's, our, you know, that's American heritage, you know, stick the king in the eye kind of thing. But see, in that culture, see, before an earthly monarch, they do it. Can you imagine before the Almighty? And so Ezekiel falls on his face. And the fact that God appeared in this way to Ezekiel, this raises the expectation that God is going to reveal to Ezekiel what he's about to do. So you're reading, you see this, and you say, okay, something is coming up. Something is going on. And this, as awesome as this glory, the glory of God is, as awesome as this image is, God's glory is the, the most direct self-manifestation of his glory has been his arrival as a human being. And when you see this image, this representation he gives Ezekiel, then you think that his greatest glory is his arrival as a human being in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you think about that. You know, here is Jesus. He came in remarkably humble circumstances, living and dying in a rather obscure part of the world. You know, you imagine, you know over in, in, here in Judea, I mean, come on. God comes, and where does he come? He comes to this little place in Judea instead of, you know, like the Roman capital. He comes over here, but John chapter 1, verse 14 tells us that in Christ we beheld God's glory. And you see the glory represented to Ezekiel in this image, and then we see that in Christ we beheld God's glory. And as awesome as the glory of God is, as represented by Ezekiel and manifested in the person of Jesus Christ, it is something that we are to reflect. See, we are to reflect the glory of God through his spirit who lives in us as he transforms us to reflect the glory of Jesus Christ as he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. This is something that we as Christians are to do. We are to reflect the glory. And when you get a picture of that glory and you don't downplay it and you know, trash it, and you see how tremendous it is, and you realize that we are called to reflect that glory through the transforming work of the Spirit. Woo! That's big. That's big. That's how we are to be. Let me keep reading here. Chapter 2, verse 1. He says, He said to me, this is God speaking to Ezekiel, He's, at the end of chapter 1, he says, And I heard the voice of one speaking. He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you, and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious house. You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious." Now, can he say they're rebellious more times? Can you, can you fit rebellious in more than that? Now, listen to what's going on here with, uh, with Ezekiel. I mean, here he, he's, he's commissioned here to be a prophet to the rebels. And Ezekiel is here, he's referred to in about 90 times through the book. He's referred to as the son of man. And the emphasis here, it's on his, his humanity and his mortality over against God's supernatural greatness and power. Now, that phrase, son of man... 
in the sense of the human, it becomes a messianic term. You know that when it's applied to Jesus as the son of man in the first century. But here the emphasis is simply on his humanity and his mortality contrasted to God's supernatural greatness and power. And God tells Ezekiel that he is sending him to speak his words to the children of Israel. And he makes clear to Ezekiel that this isn't going to be a cushy assignment. You know, this isn't going to be a breeze. You think, oh, great, I'm going to go and speak to the people of Israel, the people of God. I'm going to go and this is going to be a great thing. And he makes clear to him, ixnay, it's not going to be like that. This isn't going to be a soft job. He describes the Israelites as rebels, transgressors, impudent, and stubborn. And he instructs Ezekiel not to be afraid of them or to be afraid of their words. Now, why do you think he's telling him not to be afraid? Because he knows he's going to be tempted to be afraid. So he tells him, do not be afraid of them. The Israelites are pictured as briars and thorns and as scorpions, as things that wound and sting. See, they wound and they sting. And that's what he's being pictured. They're pictured that way and he's sending them to them. Ezekiel's assignment is to speak God's words to them. Not his own. He is to speak God's words to them and he's to do so regardless of their opposition and regardless of their refusal to hear. He doesn't sit here and say, well, wait a minute. They don't like it. You know, it's not attractive to them. I don't think they'll come. He is to speak the word of God. Deliver the word of God, whether they heed it or they don't, whether they oppose it or they don't, you preach the word of God. And when they sit here and roar against you, you have to preach the word of God. The one thing you cannot do is compromise what I'm giving you to say to them. You must say it despite the opposition, despite what they say, despite the things they'll say about you. Because they'll say all kinds of things about you, and you'll be tempted to say, I don't want to preach this message. But he's to preach it. His call is to be a faithful proclaimer of God's message. That's what he has to do. You remember 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3? Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he tells him to preach the word in season and out. See, when it's convenient and when it's not. When the people like it and when they don't. You see, being a messenger of God is not sit here, you know, it's not a love fest because sometimes the word of God breaks in and convicts people. And it says, you're the man, you need to quit, this is not right. And so people don't like that. They don't like it. And so there'll be times when they will roar against you. And your option is to say, I didn't mean that. Oh, I, I didn't mean that. Or to say, Kindly and firmly, thus saith the Lord. See, thus saith the Lord, and that's what he tells Ezekiel. He says, you're going into this place, and they're going to be opposed to you. They're going to be thorns and briars and scorpions. But you've got to preach the word. You have got to preach the word that I give to you. Chapter 2, verse 8. He says, but you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me. It was a scroll which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. And he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. See, unlike rebellious Israel, contrary to rebellious Israel, Ezekiel is to heed the word of the Lord. He is to be a faithful servant, one who can be trusted to faithfully discharge the assignment that God is giving him. He's given him a tough assignment. He says, you're going to go in here and preach to people who are impudent, hard-hearted, stubborn, rebellious. And they're going to oppose you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Okay, he says, but you are to be faithful. Unlike these rebellious people, you are to be faithful in the discharge of the duty and the responsibility I'm giving to you. Now, the scroll that he gives him, this represents God's message for Israel. 
And the fact that there's writing on both sides of the scroll indicates that he's going to call Ezekiel to communicate a great deal because typically scrolls were only written on one side. So he's got writing on both sides of the scroll, so he's going to be called to say a lot to the people of Israel. And the message he's to preach is in large part going to be bad news to the Israelites. It's going to be one that will produce lamentations, mourning, and woe. Now who likes to do that? You see, who likes to come and say, These kinds of things. But the truth of God is a message in this circumstance that will produce lamentations, mourning, and woe. That's how it is. So if you happen to be in a culture where the message of God produces in that culture anger, mourning, woe, whatever, what do you do? You have to preach what it is. You preach what it is. And we'll trust the word of God to do what it's intended to do. And if everybody and his mother sticks his tongue out and says, I'm out of (laughs) here. You know what Jesus said, would you go also? Would you go also? So he's called to preach this word and he's called to preach and he eats this scroll. And the scroll he's going to communicate a lot. And the message is going to be uh, something that produces lamentations and mourning and woe. Now, the action of his eating the scroll, I think it suggests several things. The fact that he gives him this scroll and then he eats it, it says that obedience, see, when he obeys this unusual command, I think it says that he's willing to be a faithful servant. He's willing to be the servant that God is calling him to be. He says, here, eat this scroll. Now, can you imagine this thing? I, I sit here and roll this thing up. This isn't chocolate. I mean, this is a scroll. He says, eat it. Okay, what's Ezekiel do? Ezekiel eats it. He says yes to the call of God by saying yes to doing whatever God asks him. Now, you're going to see a little bit later when he asks him to cook something over human excrement. He says, basically, come on, can you give me a break on that one? And not, I mean, he's happy to cook it over animal excrement. It was a human excrement that, he, that would make it unclean and defile him. So he said, and God said, okay. But he gives him this scroll to eat, and he winds up, and he just sits here and eats it, and it also symbolizes the importance that Ezekiel is to attach to the message of God. It is to be as his food. You see, the fact he eats this message, it is to be as his food. It is to be essential for his life. You remember when Jesus said in John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work? See, he was indicating in that the priority of God's will in his life that it is more important than anything. And that is what's symbolized here in Ezekiel. The message he's called to deliver is to be his food. It is to be his top priority. God is sending him as a spokesman into this nation, these group of exiles, and his message has to be his top priority. Not his popularity, not his safety, none of that. He has to live for the message of God. And that's what he calls him to do. And he's eating this message says that it is to be as your food. Okay, you are, it is to be your top priority. And the fact that he's to fill his stomach with the scroll suggests that it's to be all that he delivers. He fills his stomach with it. There's no room for his own stuff. It is to be the message of God that he is to deliver to the exiles. He has nothing to preach except what God gives him. And the fact that this nasty-looking scroll actually tasted sweet When he was faithful to what God said for him to do, he eats it and it tastes sweet. Well, that says that that allows him to experience that faithfulness with, with regard to God's word is the path to blessing, even when it may not appear to be so. I wouldn't have thought that eating that scroll would have tasted as sweet as honey. God says, eat the scroll. He just says, okay, I'm eating it. And he says, hey, it tasted as sweet as honey. Okay, so I think there are things that are tied up in this, in the, what he's doing. And a lot of these things that you'll see from Ezekiel, he acts out things. And then you and I as readers, we need to try to pull out what is he saying here when he does these things. Chapter 3, verse 4. Chapter 3, verse 4, he says, Then he said to me, Son of man, go now to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. You are not being sent to a people of obscure speech and difficult language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many peoples of obscure speech and difficult language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely if I'd sent you to them, they would have listened to you. 
But the house of Israel is not willing to listen to you because they are not willing to listen to me. For the whole house of Israel is hardened and obstinate. But I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious house. Now God tells him here, he tells him in, this, in the, these words that though he's sending him to his own people, okay, to people who speak his own language, they're not going to listen to him because they won't listen to God. That's why they're not going to listen to him. They don't, they're rebellious people. They won't listen to him because they don't listen to God, and they don't listen to God because they're impudent and hard-hearted. Okay, so though it's going to look like it's a rejection of Ezekiel, at root it is a rejection of God. And see, that's how it is. When you and I preach the message of God in this world, and people snarl at us and say, you're a right-wing nut or you're whatever it is, you know, crawl back under your rock, you Neanderthal. Well, what are we tempted to do? Well, I don't want you to think I'm unsophisticated. I mean, you know, I'm really a bright guy. Right? I mean, aren't we tempted to do that? Instead of say, hey, this is the word of God. Here it is. This is what we're called to. We are called to come and surrender to Christ. No, I'm going to have this lifestyle live this way. You cannot be Christ and live that way. I don't like that. I don't like that. You're a nut. I can find somebody who says you can. You can find all the people you want. But I'm telling you, the truth of God is you can't live that way. You have to come give it all up to him. They don't like that message. Some do. I don't know if they like it, but some will receive it. Okay? So he's sitting here and he's facing these kinds of things. This resistance that he meets uh, as a faithful spokesman for God, it's not going to be personally directed, but it's going to appear it's that way. Now God encourages him. He encourages him with the statement that he's given him the strength to face their hostility and it's symbolically expressed as making his face strong and hard against them. These people are going to be just coming after you, roaring after you. He says, I'm going to give you stuff, strength. It's going to be as hard as flint as they come after you. Well, now, this is good news. Because if I had to stand in the face of this kind of opposition without the strength of God, who can do that? But he's telling Ezekiel, you be faithful to me. You preach the message. I'm, and though they just roar and go crazy... I will be there giving you strength to withstand the assault that they bring against you for pre presenting my word. Okay, now that's great. That's great that he sits here and he tells him that. He's going to, he's going to give him strength. It's not going to be easy to be faithful in proclamation, but God will give him courage. Now, what he cannot do is alter the message. God's going to give him strength when they, when they roar against him, but what he cannot do is alter the message. And this is the temptation. In the face of opposition, it is the temptation to change the message so the message will be pleasing to the people you're presenting it to. Okay, well, I didn't mean that. I'm not saying you have to be an idiot about preaching and just sit here and go out here and scream at people and say, hey, how many people can I offend today? Can I invent new ways of offending people? But there is a great danger when we start thinking, listen, I have to make this attractive to people it takes the wisdom of Solomon to say, how do I do that without altering the message to tickle their ears? Because we live in a culture that does not like this message. That's just a fact. It doesn't like it. When you talk about there is one way to God through Jesus Christ, oh, what about the Buddhist? What about this person? You say, I believe the God of the Bible, he has revealed this, that there is one way to God. What about the faithful serving Jew? He's lost. Lost without Jesus Christ. Now, does that offend people? What do they do? Oh, I can't take that. Well, I don't know what to do. I mean, I can sit here and say, well, well, no, I think that, you know, all people are, even those who reject Jesus Christ. Well, look, I can read. I can read. So are we going to present the message or are we going to be scared off the message because people will think that's too narrow in our culture. If it's the truth, it's the truth. Now, we have to be careful that we understand the truth. I know all that. But we have to be bold in proclamation. And I see this in Ezekiel when he's called to do these things. He says he cannot alter the message. Chapter 3, verse 10. And he said to me, Son of man, listen carefully and take to heart all the words I speak to you. Go now to your countrymen in exile and speak to them. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, whether they listen 
or fail to listen. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a loud rushing sound. May the glory of the Lord be praised in his dwelling place. The sound of the wings of the living creatures brushing against each other, and the sound of the wheels beside them, a loud rushing sound. The Spirit then lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness and in anger of spirit with the strong hand of the Lord upon me. I came to the exiles who lived at Tel Aviv near the Kabar River, and there... Where they were living, I sat among them for seven days, overwhelmed. So here we have Ezekiel. He here is, is divinely delivered to his audience. Now, I've heard people on you know, Channel 21 talk about this kind of stuff. I don't believe it happened to them. I know it happened to Ezekiel. See, he was, he was divinely transported to his, his audience. And God tells him, he says, receive into your heart all my words... All the words, all my words that I speak to you and hear with your ears, the way NIV says, listen carefully. God tells him, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you and hear with your ears. And the point is that Ezekiel is to be accurate in transmission. See, that is the measure of a messenger. Fidelity in transmission. We are messengers and we are given a message. And that is why I see preaching and teaching is a responsibility that has to be taken seriously because you dare to represent another in speaking to people. You see, this is, this is a holy enterprise that you dare to do that. Now, you can't do it and not realize that you are weak, flawed, sinful, and capable of error. But you better not do it casually. Okay, you better not just sit here and fall in and sit here and let, let me just say some junk. Because you don't like it when you're misrepresented. If I went to somebody and say, Merrill told me this, and Merrill never said that, he wouldn't like it. He would come over to me and go, what are you doing? Why are you saying that I said this, I think this, I believe this, when I don't? Well, that's how God is, and that's why he's, he is stressing to Ezekiel that you have to be faithful in transmission. You take what I say in, you take this in, and you receive it into your heart, and you hear it with your ears, don't misunderstand or forget. Don't misunderstand. You take it into your heart. You listen carefully. Take it into your heart. You hear it right. And don't forget it. You are to be faithful in transmission. Now, he's miraculously transported from his position near this Kabar Canal to Tel Aviv proper to the exiles to whom he is to prophesy. Now, you can just imagine this, right? Here is this guy. He's been, you know, he's been awed by God all his life. He then is given this vision that blows his socks off, and then he's taken, and he's delivered to the people. And you can just sit here and say, oh, man. You know, I mean, it's like, whatever his faith was and whatever he knew, this experience had to just rock him. It absolutely had to rock him. And he's taken, he, his being taken up, it says it's accompanied by bitterness and agitation. And that's perfectly understandable, isn't it? He was just a little while ago, a nondescript exile. He was just one among many. Now all of a sudden, the Lord has called him to a ministry that he's telling him, this is going to be tough. They're going to come after you. There are going to be thorns and briars and scorpions. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'll give you strength. I'll harden you. You know, he said, and said, wait a minute, I was, you know, I mean, this wasn't, this wasn't great, but I was just a nobody sitting over here. Now look what you're calling me to do. Certainly his spirit's going to be roiled. He's going to be agitated. And he is. Because he's being called to a, to a work that God has told him in advance. This isn't going to, you know, win friends and all this kind of stuff. The message I'm giving you is going to be one of lamentations and mornings and woe, largely. And people don't like it. They're not going to like it. And so you can just see why he's all, he, he's churned up here. He says the hand of the Lord was strong on him, meaning that he was under God's direction, which is precisely why he is distressed. He knew that faithfulness to what God was calling him to do would not mean easy living. Okay, so he's churned up about it. Now, the visions, the conversations, the experience of that miraculous transport, it simply overwhelms him. And I understand that. He was in spiritual shock for a week. 
Okay, he gets transported and he's just sitting there, floored for a week. You know, trying to wrap his mind around what has happened, what God has called him to do, what it's going to mean for his life. And so he sits there, just floored, thinking about what had happened and its implications. Chapter 3, verse 16. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life, that wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do do warn the wicked man, and he does not turn away from his wickedness or from his evil ways... He will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before him, he will die. Since you did not warn him, he will die for his sin. The righteous things he did will not be remembered, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the righteous man not to sin, and he does not sin, he will surely live because he took warning and you will have saved yourself. Well, after this uh, week-long period of recuperation, God tells Ezekiel that he's made him a watchman or a sentinel for the house of Israel. And God has given him the responsibility of delivering his warnings. Okay, you're going to be called to deliver warnings to people. You know, right away. Man, you got to be so negative. Oh, man, don't, don't be coming down on me with this negative stuff. He's called to deliver these warnings, and as one who sounds God's warning, warnings, his role as a watchman, it's really one of mercy, right? I mean, isn't somebody who warns somebody really a person of mercy? I mean, if you're, you're going down the road and the bridge is out, and I say the bridge is out, I'm being merciful. But what happens in the spiritual realm, I try to tell somebody, that listen, the bridge is out, and they sit there and want to punch you. Who do you think you are? You're so self-righteous. No, I'm just, I'm just trying to help you. I understand that the bridge is out. Well, he's called to issue warnings, and issuing warnings is really an act of mercy, but it's not going to be perceived that way by those who don't want to hear it. A lot of people pre- pre- prefer to live in a delusion. They prefer for you not to pop their bubble. They've created a world. They've created a world, for instance, of what Christianity is. We have real Christianity, and then we have this stuff, you know, we've got all kinds of varieties that we can make up, which shouldn't be called Christianity, but they are, and you can just go pick. You know, you want to live with your girlfriend, be a Christian, that's fine, we go over here and take this one. You want to do these things, that's fine, just come over here and do this. That's not Christianity. What you're doing is you're making up your own religion. And like people talk about, you know, fundamentalists have hijacked Christianity. Of course, they play off that with the Muslim thing. It's the way they criticize people like me. They say that they've hijacked Christianity. You want know, somebody who's hijacked it? It's people who are ordaining homosexuals to preach. Okay? Homosexuals can be Christians. I understand that. No sin beyond the forgiveness of God. But they have to come to Christ penitent. We live in a culture that sits there and says the very idea that God would call anyone to repentance is crazy. That it's crazy. Okay, so you say that, and what happens? They don't like it. But he sits here and he says, listen, you know, you are to issue warnings, and regarding the wicked, if Ezekiel fails to deliver God's warnings so that they might repent and be spared, God says, I'm telling you to warn these people. These people who are living in sin, you must warn them. That is your function. And he says, listen, if you fail to do that, you're going to share in the responsibility for their condemnation. I have sent you as my spokesman. I understand it's tough. I understand they're not going to like it, but I'm calling you to warn them. If you are intimidated, and because of that, you're afraid if you won't love them enough. Can I say that right? I mean, isn't that what it really is? We're talking about kids and all this stuff about tough love, tough love. That's tough love is telling somebody something that will make them mad, but it's true. And he tells them, he says, listen, if you won't love them enough to call them to repent of their wickedness, then you're going to share in their condemnation. Okay, he says, look, you are, the, you are on a miss, mission of mercy. And if you don't discharge it, and they go on in their wickedness, 
then you will share in their condemnation. But if you warn them and they don't repent, well, then that's not your responsibility. You can't live somebody else's life. You can warn them. You can't live their lives. If they sit here and say to you, listen, thanks for the warning. Now buzz off. Okay. You heard it. I told you the message of God. That's what God tells Ezekiel. Then regarding the righteous, he says, if Ezekiel fails to warn them when they turn to sin, he'll share, he'll have responsibility, he'll share responsibility for their condemnation. But if he warns the righteous and they avoid sin, in other words, they either don't get into it or they repent when they have, they will avoid condemnation and Ezekiel will have discharged his duty. So he says both with regard to the wicked and with regard to the righteous, you are to issue warnings that is your function. If you, if you cop out on that, if you won't do it, well then, you know, woe to you because you share in the condemnation. Now as Christians, we have the responsibility not only of telling the lost, but of maturing the body of Christ. I know how hard it is when brothers and sisters are doing things wrong that we don't want to say, well, you know, they're doing something wrong. Uh, you know, they're friends of mine or whatever it is. I do. Look, there's a higher thing at play here, Right? Don't we all honor Jesus Christ first? So I don't care who it is. Mother, father, brother, sister. I don't care. If they're doing wrong, you've got to tell them. You've got to tell them. That's what it means to serve Jesus Christ above all else. So you say to them, as nicely and politely, you warn them, you urge them that we are all disciples of Jesus Christ. This isn't a rotary club. We are people who are committed to living to honor Jesus Christ. And so one another, we build one another up that way. And we don't get defensive about it. So that, you know, you make it so you're like a porcupine when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, excuse me, ah! how dare you say something to me? You have to be willing to do that. You know, when you think something's wrong, you sit there and say, hey, you know, uh, what about this, what about that? You know, just, okay, that way we help each other. And when people do that, don't chew their head off, even if you disagree with them. Be grateful that they care enough about you that they would come to you and say, hey, you know, what about this? You know, you do it to people you love, I hope. And that's what he's calling us, you know, taking what he's saying to Ezekiel and applying it to us. See, we have to do that. We have to help each other. If we ignore the sin of our brother and sister because of some kind of misguided sense of compassion... We're not loving that person at all. Now, we may convince ourselves, this is what it means to love. Oh, I'm so accepting of his sin. You're not loving that person. You're deceiving that person. And you're doing it for selfish reasons because you do not want that person to be angry with you. Now, I understand what I'm saying is tough. Okay? I understand that. But I think it's true. And I think it's right. And we need to be that way with one another. Gently, kindly, lovingly, but we have to call each other to be faithful servants of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is, okay, whatever we're doing, we need to, we need to do that. Okay, thanks for coming.